Hello, everyone, and welcome to Call Your Hits, a Storm Riders Airsoft podcast. Thanks for joining us, everyone. Following the last few episodes where we went over some tips for beginners, especially as mindset and expectations are concerned, we wanted to share some similar tips for more experienced players. And one issue that came up in particular is the notion of player burnout. You know, when you're just starting to pick up airsoft and really actually probably most hobbies, every time you do it, it's amazing. Every game you play, it's exciting. You're constantly doing things you've never done. You're experiencing new game modes, checking out different kits and upgrades and guns, etc. And it's just all amazing all the time. And even if stuff is annoying, you don't really care because really, Airsoft is just amazing. And really, you could call this the honeymoon phase. Everything is perfect. You want to play Airsoft all the time, as many times per week as possible, and so on. And what you will notice... As you play Airsoft over the years, and sometimes over the months, sometimes over many, many years, is that that feeling will fade. You might find that games become a little bit more stale. The field you're playing on becomes old hat. You start to notice some players are not good sports. And then suddenly you find yourself not into it as much. Maybe you want to focus on other hobbies. Maybe you make up excuses about why you can't play Airsoft today, but the reality is you just don't really want to. And so now you've come out of the honeymoon phase, and maybe you start to think that Airsoft isn't really, you know, all what that's, it's cracked up to be, and maybe it's time to quit. The truth is that you are not the first Airsofter to feel this way, and in fact, we'd be willing to bet that most Airsofters will experience this feeling at some point in their time playing. So, what does it mean for you? Maybe you're here right now, and you're listening to this and thinking, geez, you know what, I do feel like that. So... What can you do if you start to feel this way? And that's really what we want to get into today. So talk. we're going to talk a little bit about what that looked like for Patrick and myself, having played for Airsoft for, you know, over, well, 10, 15 years apiece, let's say. What it looked like for us and some of the things that we did right in terms of trying to get out of that sort of funk, let's say. And finally, what we think you can do if you're currently in this place where you're starting to feel like you're out of this honeymoon phase, what is it that you can do to sort of try and break through that? And I think it's really important sort of like starting off to acknowledge that for most hobbies, um, you know, there's, there's ebb and flow, right? There's periods where you will want to do the thing really intensely and periods where it'll take a back burner because of real life stuff or because of just other hobbies being more interesting at the moment. And that's fine. That's not Mm -hmm. a problem. Uh, You shouldn't necessarily look at it as like, oh God, I'm in an airsoft slump, Um, you know, but there is also such a thing as just, you know, like, man, I, I'm not motivated to do this particular hobby. And uh, even being unmotivated while wanting to get back into doing that hobby. Yeah, absolutely. So when you think about it, Pat, like, What was that like for you coming out of it? And I would also suggest that it's possible to have multiple honeymoon phases with a particular hobby where you fall in in love with it and then out of love and then back in love with it. And I think I definitely have seen that lately with your World War II stuff. Um, But yeah, so what was that like for you? Yeah, so I mean, uh, I'm definitely a creature of um, cyclical obsessions, shall we say. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, in my... uh, in my wargaming hobby that I've mentioned before, like, you know, I, uh, I just rotate which game I'm playing, right? Sometimes I'm like, oh man, I'm going to play me some Warhammer. And other times I'm like, eh, maybe I'll just play some Battletech or whatever, right? Uh, mm-hmm. With Airsoft, it sort of depends on the kind of slump because I've, I've been in a bunch of them, right? You know, um, and I'm willing to cop to that, right? There have been, there have been periods in my life where like I was just working, um, you know, uh, four jobs because I, uh, I, I've been a substitute teacher um, for a chunk of my airsoft playing career. And for those who aren't aware, that is not a high paying job. So you end up working, you know, two or three jobs and it can end up being very exhausting. Right. And so there've been points in the last, you know, in the last 10 years where I just, you know, you were like, Pat, we're going to play airsoft at 9am on Saturday. And I was like, I just can't (laughs) like, I do not have the, the energy. I do not exist at that time of day anymore. I'm sorry. Right. Uh, and, I think that ultimately, um, 
that particular version, like, okay, it's okay to be exhausted, right? But there were also definitely some weekends where I wasn't exhausted and where uh, you sort of, you know, used the fact that we've been friends forever to guilt me into going or whatever. And uh, I went and I was like, holy shit, I f- I've forgotten how much I enjoy this. Damn, right? Mm-hmm. And so, like, one of the first things I will say, as silly as it sounds, about, like, getting out of a slump in terms of, like, oh, I don't want to play yourself as much as I used to, is, like, go play. But, like, try to, if you're... If you're short on time, right, if time is the constraint, and it was for me at that point, like, picking days where I was going with, you know, with you, with more of our team, with specifically people who, like, I'd go out of my way to spend time with anyway, was a really Mm -hmm. huge benefit. Yeah. Um, And, like, that definitely helped. Um, You know, I found um, the, like, we formed the team um, before I'd ever had an airsoft slump, right? Um, you know, yeah. like, uh, my first, I'd say, like, four years of airsoft was like, yeah, I want to play. Like, is it a weekend? Can we actually get out and get a game? Is the weather not, like, complete garbage? All right, cool. Um, and I think as I've gotten sort of uh, <laughs> older and lazier, um, like, there are, there are definitely days where I would have gone to play, um, like, 100% where I've gone, like, oh, it's cold and gross out and I don't want to. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm not sure if that's like a diminished passion or an increased, like, oh, it's cold out and I don't want to be cold all day. (laughs) And I mean, I think that's fair. Like when we, when I started playing, you know, back in 2006, I wanted to play every single weekend, you know, whether we had eight players or we had four players, there were games where we played and it was four people. It was in the rain, you know, uphill both ways, like all that kind of stuff. Um, and I was game for it. Like, bring it on. I don't care if there's three people out there and it's snowing sideways. Let's yep. do it. Let's have a game or whatever. I definitely remember playing when we started, like the summer I started playing, there being like games where it was like, it was foggy, it was raining, it was like five degrees in June because we live in Newfoundland, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. Uh, and like, you were like, Pat, we're going to go play Airsoft on Saturday. And I was like, yes. And like, you feel like, you feel like a badass getting all your gear ready and you know you're going to get soaked and you know it's going to be hard conditions. And that's sort of like, that makes it even more mystifying because you're like, yeah, I'm so hardcore. Look at what I'm doing. And the reality is that after you've done that several times, that sort of loses its appeal, especially in a situation where it's just a skirmish, you know, like it's not a special game. There's no special missions, etc. And maybe, you know, for, for me, like we had been playing on that field, like Frontline at the time was not catering to Airsoft. So we played Air, we played Airsoft at Redcliffe for years and years and years with no other alternative field not really the same people and a largely a a small group of people playing the same game modes over and over and over and we tried little variations here or there and we played you know different types of games every now and then just to sort of spice things up but the reality is we just did the same stuff over and over and after a while that really that does get stale and i think there that's a reality for uh for for lots of airsofters it's not everyone who has the luxury like some of the guys on our discord for example uh of having a few fields within driving distance so if you don't like the gameplay at one you go to the other and you could say well we have that same here thing here in st john's where we can go to Frontline or we can go to Redcliffe. But the reality is a lot of people don't want to play at Redcliffe anymore for a variety of reasons. So we end up playing at, at Frontline and it's the same same types of games over and over. And you need to sort of eventually realize that if you're doing that once a week, twice a week, every week, every month of the year, at some point you're going to be like, you know what? I've already done this with six players or eight players. I've done it 10 times this year. I'm not interested in doing that anymore things getting sort of old and tired, right? It's it's a part of, you know, every hobby, right? And you need to find ways to reinvigorate it if you're going to continue doing it. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, I want to say here, like, it's probably important to remember that it's okay to, you know, take some time off from a hobby, right? Uh, so, like, if you're playing yourself and you're like, man, I think I'm just going to take six months off. Sure, no problem. Probably don't sell your gear, right? Unless you've not played for, like, a couple of years and you're like, oh, yeah, I think I'm done. Right, mm-hmm. You want to be sure you're done before you sell off your airsoft kit because it's expensive and you won't get, you know, like full value for it and then you'll have to buy it again. It'll just be shitty. 
And, you know, so it's interesting when you when you say that, like taking time off the hobby and stuff like one of the things that you need to be honest with yourself about is whether or not you're still having fun. Right. And one of the things we see a lot and I mean, in our conversations, uh, you know, myself and Pat, like we mentioned before, we've known each other for a very, very long time. And there's there's several times where I've asked Pat to come play airsoft and he's told me, no, I can't because and I'm like 99 percent sure it was bullshit. Right. <laughs> the reality is he didn't happened. want to play. That's definitely happened. Like I. I'm not trying to bullshit my friend. I'm just, you know, like most people are. It's like, oh, well, you know, it's easier to make an excuse than to just be like, yeah, I don't want to. Yeah, totally. And I've done the exact same thing. I have absolutely said I can't make it to Airsoft because, and the reason why is just that I didn't really want to play for whatever reason. Uh, It was just not, didn't look like a fun thing to me. And the reality is people often feel like they're going to be judged by the rest of the people for not showing up, but it's supposed to be fun. And if you don't think it's going to be fun, then you probably shouldn't be spending your time doing that. However, I think something Pat said at the start is very, very important, is that you don't think it's going to be fun, but when you get out there, you likely will be having a good time. So in some cases, it's worthwhile to just push through that sort of like, I don't really want to, and realize that actually, you know what, you're going to have a great time when you get out there. The challenge is if you push yourself to do it and you get out there and you're still not having fun, that's when you need to start thinking, okay, well, maybe I'm burnt out and what am I going to do about this now? I think it's a really important point, right? Like one of the great things about playing with Phil specifically is that, you know, uh, he's close enough to me. He's known me long enough and we're honest enough with each other that he can look at me and be like, that excuse is bullshit. Just like, come on, you'll have fun. And I'll go and I'll be like, yeah, I really like getting out of bed and dragging my ass to the field was awful. But like, I'm having a lot of fun. Awesome. Right. Um, That's been really good for making getting me to go play when I might not have. Um, and I'm mm-hmm. sure Phil has had me do the same thing too. <laughs> totally. And and other people on the team as well, like just, you know, knowing, you know, knowing that other people are expecting you to show up is, is, uh, is one of the, you know, primary motivators for me to actually get up out of bed. I know that once I roll out of bed and start, you know, getting my gear on and stuff, I'll be, I'll be good to go. But, you know, sometimes you need that a little extra boost. And like the result there for me is yeah like you know having friends who you play with is a big part of keeping you in the hobby for a lot of people certainly it is for me Mm -hmm. um you know teammates friends it's the same thing really with our crew like you know there's no one on our team who i wouldn't hang out with outside of playing yourself for fun because they're awesome Mm -hmm. um and i think we're very sort of lucky in that way but i i don't feel like if you're going out and playing and you're finding it hard to go play but you're having fun when you're playing that you're in a situation where you're really in that much of a slump uh Mm -hmm. so much as it is like maybe you know bed was cozy today or you know uh whatever if you're going out to play and you're there and you're like man this sucks i'm not having fun and i've been there like there have been points in playing your software i was just like i'm you know i'm gonna go because it's hanging out with my friends and i'm gonna go because my team is relying on me to show up and pull my weight and play, but where I haven't actually had that much fun doing it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's really, I think the, the thing we're trying to address with this episode is just that point where you're like, I'm not having fun and I need to figure out a way to make this fun again. Mm -hmm. And one of the key ways that you do that firstly is understanding why is it that you're not having fun? Right. Absolutely. And so in some cases, it could be because the game modes, as we talked in, maybe are stale, the field is stale, et cetera, and you can shake things up or whatever. But before we get into that too much, one of the things I also want to talk about, and we've addressed this a little bit in the past, but one of the key reasons that people don't tend to have fun in certain situations is because they are not living up to their own expectations for themselves, for their own performance. Totally. I've definitely had days at Airsoft where I didn't have any fun because I was in my head about like, oh, I should be doing better. Yeah. And there are lots of people, lots of cases, and it's happened to me and it's happened to people on our team, where they are nervous about going to play Airsoft because they feel that the expectation for their performance is very high. And they don't necessarily want to deal with that expectation. It's like, if I go tomorrow, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to have to do really well. And if not, it's going to suck and it's going to be horrible. And I'd just rather not deal with that whole, that whole situation. And emotionally, that can be very taxing. Right, that requires a lot of emotional bandwidth to be able to deal with, you know. Um, without tr- without you know trying to toot our own horn here, the reality is that many players in our community, and maybe you guys too, tend to think that we're pretty good players, and as a result, they have an expectation of how we're going to perform on the field, or rather, we have an expectation 
of what they think their expectation of us is, right? Which is a little bit like, you know, expectationception here. But the reality is that we assume what their expectations for us are. And as a consequence of that, we have to live up to them in order to be truly having a good time and truly, you know, pulling our weight on the field and stuff. And that's exhausting, or that can be exhausting. Uh, when really, you just want to go out there and have fun. When you're a beginner, you don't have that expectation because you don't know anything about anything. Nobody's expecting you to do anything on the field except just show up and be a beginner noob and just maybe get a kill here or there. But basically, you're just carefree. You do whatever you want. But once you've played at the field 15, 16, 20, 25, 50 times or whatever, the other players are going to go, oh yeah, that's so-and-so. He's good at this. He's good at that. And they expect you to do that. And if you don't live up to that, then that can really suck and it can be an extra burden. Ultimately, there's, you know, we've talked before about the fact that like, you know, yeah, I I often go play Airsoft and, you know, we're going to play a five minute, you know, team deathmatch. And sometimes I'm I'm great, but often I'm like, oh yeah, cool. I'm going to kick ass. And then I get shot in the face. And it's like, oh, yeah, well airsoft whatever yeah. um you know the reality is everyone is going to get shot in the face sometimes whatever but i guess I, we probably haven't addressed the fact that like yeah as a as a player who's been playing for a really long time uh who's like yeah i know like i have decent personal skills sometimes i come out of around a thing and i just get lit up and it's like man that you know there's the brief feels bad of like oh yeah like i was hoping to do well oh well but there's mm-hmm. there is some embarrassment to it right there can or there can be there can be a moment of like well aren't i supposed to be good at this shit <laughs> yeah totally and all of that contributes to your burnout right so not only are you playing games on a field and it's a little bit stale not only are there some other bad attitudes in the field that are wearing thin on you but in, on top of all of that you're getting frustrated because you're not doing as well as you would want to or as you think people expect you to and so all of that really can contributes to just you know what like i can't i can't deal with this anymore like it's this is no fun so what are you going to do about it well you know let's share some of the things that we have done over the years to try and break through that so i know for me one of the things that i found the most fun and one of the ways that i was able to break through that mold um is actually by going to the to a game with john and doing world war ii reenactment reenactment kit uh, I did his 101st Easy Company kit and he did like a Canadian para like he always does or not he always does, but like that he does frequently. And because I was using completely unfamiliar kit, I was using a completely unfamiliar gun that was unupgraded. I had mags that I barely knew how to reload from initially because I don't know how Thompson works. I'd never used one. It's pretty cumbersome compared to the M4 too, right? Like it's, totally. It, it like is, it was very unfamiliar. There are some improvements that have been made between the Thompson and the M4. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, you would one would hope. Right. But my my point in saying this is that like because of all of these different handicaps that I had, my expectation for myself was nil, right? I had absolutely no expectation to perform. I had absolutely no qualms that I was going to get shot a lot because I was using some stock gun with all kinds of weird gear, no camo, it's just whatever. And I had an absolute blast. It was a total totally fun because I was completely freed of all those expectations. It was legit just go out there, have a bit of fun. The field is different because your gear is different. T- completely new experience. So that's one way that I was able to shake shake it up a bit. And then once I got out of that kit and back in my regular kit, I had a whole new appreciation for the gear that I was wearing, you know, in, in the day of. Absolutely. And like, I think we can talk about, um, you know, with, with some honesty on both of our parts, like there've been periods where our gear was just underperforming and that was making our day suck because we just didn't have a gun that was working right. Cause we'd put a part in it that turned out not to be so great or just something weird wasn't working right. And, mm-hmm. you know, uh, there have definitely been points where I think both of us have walked away and been like, I think I'm just going to take some time off until my gun is working right. And I'm sure of it because it's just pissing me off and I can't deal with that. Totally. Yep. Um, and you know, I think uh, at this point we have a little bit of benefit where like we have enough weird and interesting gear across our team that you can be like, well, maybe I'll just play something that is not my normal approach today, right? Maybe I will dress up Absolutely. in World War II gear um, to get away from that. But that's an opportunity that has come out of the fact that, you know, most of our teammates are a little older than we were when we started and we have a little more disposable income. So we've bought more silly things. Yeah. You know. And I think, you know, that applies to World War II kit, but it applies to different stuff. Like I know talking to John, for example, one of the ways that he's gotten out of the slump is by swapping his M4 for an FNFAL. 
right? Completely different platform, um, completely different reloads, completely different everything, basically. But the reason he's done that is because, from his point of view, using the M4 was kind of stale. Like, he he basically, from his from his perspective, he had he was as good as he was going to get with it, and that wasn't entertaining for him. So he swapped his kit out, and he's you know a bit of a uh, a bit of a nut for like historical kit and old stuff and whatnot. So that's fine and dandy. A bit, he says. <laughs> well, yeah, and, but that's one of the ways that he's kept it sort of interesting for himself by just swapping out his kit and giving him another challenge on the field. And I can definitely relate to that. One of the things that's definitely happened when I've sort of hit places like slumps in airsoft uh, was you know. Um, I'm I'm definitely an ooh shiny kind of person, right? And so new shiny toys are not a bad way to uh, to sort of feel the love again if you're a bit on the on the down and outs with their soft. You know, um, I wouldn't necessarily recommend you go buy a uh, an A and K uh, Mark Forty Six. That one was a bit heavy for me. I didn't enjoy it as much as I thought I was going to. But like, it got me out of bed. It got me to go play. It definitely was a thing where I was like, yeah, I'm stoked to try this weirdness, right? Yeah, try this absolutely. different approach to playing. Um, and I don't think you can oversell that. I think that's tremendously important and tremendously good for your, your play experience. And like, it doesn't even need to be a big new piece of kit, right? Like, you know, um, just, you know, Hey, I, uh, I put a new stock on my gun can actually change your comfort level can change what you're trying totally. to figure out doing. Um, you know, so if you're, if you're in a bit of a slump, um, as weird as this sounds, especially given that you're already like, you know, oh, I'm going to pay money to go play airsoft and engage in my hobby. Yeah, like treat yourself a little, buy something neat. Or even like, like I did with John, just borrow something and try it out if you have teammates that will let you do it. And like Pat said, you know, that could be as easy as a stock. It could be changing from a plate carrier to a chest rig. It could be not running with a belt. It could be, you know, um, a, a bunch of challenging yourself in different ways that make the game more interesting by modifying your own personal skills, right? So that's certainly one aspect. So your own gear, your own kit. The other thing that you can do is change what you're doing on the field, right? So obviously, if you are changing your kit and you're going for like a, um, you know, like a, a sniper setup, for example, obviously it's going to change your what you're doing on the field in terms of your positioning and stuff. It's going to change how the game feels to you in a really significant and meaningful sense. Yeah, absolutely. Or you can also just change how you do on the field so you can uh, get into a position where you're like okay i instead of you know uh rushing all the time because that's what i've been doing i'm going to sit back a little bit and try and coordinate movement on the field be a bit more of a leader rather than a door kicker right that's something you can try to change your approach on the field and like one of the benefits there with uh, having a team having a group of people even just having a couple of friends who you play with regularly uh is yeah you can swap gear around right if I want to spend a day kicking doors in more so than I usually do, and I look at Phil and go, hey, do you want to swap guns for the day? He'll pretty much go, yeah, sure, right, you know? Well, that's because your gun is also really good. <laughs> I mean, that's probably also true, but, like, you still, you know what I mean, right? Like, it's yes, yeah. independent of the quality of the, the rifle. Like, if I, if the only gun I could bring, had brought to the field for a day was the Grand, and I was still like, hey, man, do you want to you know, swap guns for a couple of games, you'd be like, sure, even though I know for a fact you find the grand uncomfortable to shoot because you don't actually like that sort of, uh, air quotes, traditional rifle hold that much. Yeah, I don't like the rifle grip, and I'm five foot nothing, so come on now. Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> um, <laughs> so that's certainly one way that you can deal with this slump. The other thing that has really worked for me personally, and I know for Pat as well, is to make the shift from not just playing games, but organizing them running games absolutely coming up with scenarios coming up with ideas and one of the ways you can do this is just you know by suggesting to the ref for example at your field uh suggesting a game mode this is an idea that i had for a game let's give this a, a shot right so one of the things that you can do uh, as an easy quick little fix is if your field has a particular orientation that you play maybe you always play north to south on your field maybe you try running a game where you play east to west Right? That's your suggestion to the ref to change the way that the field is actually laid out, to change the way the cover is, to give you a new play experience. And then if that works well, you can layer on, maybe we try different objectives. So maybe your flags are always in the same place. Well, maybe you move them or maybe you use different flags. Right? Maybe you do an objective-based game where you have to use... Um, 
you know, a prop and get it from point A to point B, or maybe you have to get the ref from point A to point B as a sort of like a VIP or something like that. There's different ways that you can change the dynamic on the field by just changing the game modes. And that's very much akin to, like Pat was saying at the start, you know, maybe I don't want to play Warhammer, but I'm going to play Battletech, right? So maybe you're playing League and you're just like, oh, you know what, I'm going to play ARAM or whatever, right? Just ways that you can shake up the game so that you're not just dumping it forever, but you're trying something new. And worst case, you hate it and it gives you a brand new appreciation for the things that you liked from the previous game modes that you were doing. Or you discover things that you're like, well, I didn't really like it, but I can bring this back or this other thing back. We can try this, we can try that. And then suddenly you're coming up with ideas around game modes that work, game modes that don't work, and maybe you want to organize your own game, right? Maybe it's the scenario. And that's what we did, right? We came up with our scenario ideas that we wanted, layouts that we thought we were fun, that we thought were fun, concepts that we wanted to try out, and then we got people to sign up and run them. One of the things that we found, I think, is that the entire community here has been really like, yeah, we'll try anything. Like, new stuff is cool. Uh, And fairly forgiving for when we've tried new stuff and it's been terrible. Uh, Because that's happened. Um, You know, and especially I want to give a shout out to, you know, the the refs at Frontline in general being pretty happy to have us come and be like, hey, can we try something new? I think part of that is that it is making their job easier because we're providing our own um approach to trying to entertain ourselves for a while but Mm -hmm. you know there is also a lot to be said just for the fact that they're welcome that they look at us and go yeah no no problem come on right and it's not just because it's us to be clear i think the refs would uh, would welcome any good idea from any player right we're not going in there flaunting our status if we have such a thing um to to say hey this is what we want to do you know cater to us but like pat said i think it's you know most players and refs will welcome the perspective of, hey, you know what? Maybe we should try this. It might be fun. And they might tell you they've already done it and it doesn't work and X for X, Y, Z reasons, which is totally legit. But in some cases, they come up with, uh, with you can come up with ideas that have never been tried. And I know last year in particular, um, one of the refs came up with a way for us to do like a, a, a bomb, uh, what was it called? Like, um, but it's like from Team Fortress, I think, where you have to stay next to the payload. Oh, it's payload. payload. That's what it's called. Where you have to push the payload down the field. And so he created this small enclosure for himself that was protected from BBs. More, mostly, he did take a couple of hits. God bless him. Uh, but basically, whenever we were in physical contact with him, he would slowly saunter down the field. Um, and then we would try to uh, try to get him to the other end. And the game mode had... Lots of problems with it, but it was super fun. We came up with a couple of different, you know, solutions to try it again. Next time we're going to do this that differently to balance it out a bit. Overall, it was a great game mode, though, and it's a good way to really try stuff out and see how uh, see how you can refresh the play experience for yourself. Absolutely. And like, I mean, it was different. It was a laugh. 10 out of 10, you know, that's, those are probably the best goals, I think, for trying to develop a new Airsoft thing to do is you want it to either be like fun and if it's funny and silly, that's that's fine. You know, um, I feel like we're often all at risk of taking this hobby a little too seriously. Um, and I feel that's often true of every hobby, but like particularly Airsoft um, in my experience. And, you know, therefore I feel like having a laugh at, you know, our own expense is often a really good idea. Um, mm-hmm. You know, and as Phil mentioned earlier, you know, this is, this is hardly the only way to do it. I do think probably the best way to to get out of a slump with Airsoft is to go brainstorm ideas with your friends and try new stuff. Definitely. Yeah. You know, uh, Phil alluded earlier to the fact that like, I'm hella excited about my world war two kit, you know? Um, and don't get me wrong. That was an expensive way to reinvigorate my desire to play Airsoft. Um, but it's been a really effective one, you know? Yeah. Um, I'm a big history nerd. Um, I sort of inadvertently have become a big world war two history nerd. It, it's weird to me cause I wasn't really one, um, when I was a kid, except for, uh, a brief stint in like grade five or grade six being obsessed with like world war two fighter planes. I am interested in living history stuff. So I guess it's not that big a jump in that sense. Um, but yeah, the idea of, you know, getting kitted out in historically accurate world war two gear and humping far too much equipment around <laughs> for no good reason. Um, while carrying a, um, an empirically less efficient airsoft gun, uh, is really appealing to me. Um, and, uh, every time I've used it, you know, I haven't, still haven't really gotten to play in the full kit because thank you COVID. But, um, you know, every time I've played with even like parts of it as I've bought stuff and just playing with the grind is a laugh. 
and it's it's very totally it's very different um it's included some hilarious like wow this this gun is a lot better than i thought a stock gun was gonna be <laughs> yeah yeah you. that's true um it's yeah. like oh look at that 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 worked better than it should have cool mm-hmm. um which is a fun experience but you know lots of like how does this even work how do i shoot a rifle rather than like an a modern ar style pistol gripped piece of equipment like it's just how do i aim this how do i use iron sights what are iron sights um and like it's worth noting also that i've had lasik in the sort of period while i've been building this kit so i'm also like going out last season you know the first couple of games with the grand was also the first couple of games with my new eyes and i'm like could you all see this well before (laughs) yeah y'all have been cheating (laughs) so if you're in a position right now where you're in a bit of a slump right we've already touched on a couple of different things and so to just recap a little bit first thing is if you give yourself a new challenge Right, whether that's by changing your kit around, by adopting or borrowing some kit, uh, by forcing yourself into a different role in the field, what you can find is that will sort of take the focus away from the things that are sort of maybe nagging at you and give you something else to focus on and to work on and to refresh your, your, your play experience. It will also have this added benefit of removing any of your own expectations for performance. Right. Because one of the things, as we said, that happens is as you get better at a hobby, you realize how much you really suck at it. Right. And that can be a real downer for some people. And that can, in many ways, uh, can be the trigger for people to quit. And so if you remind yourself that you're still learning by trying different new, new different things, that can give you the energy to keep going through it. And putting yourself in a situation where um, where pressures have built up in your hobby and you're instead of experiencing those, you're going to go play and you're going to relax while you're relaxing which is a bit paradoxical, but is really the way of things can be mm-hmm. huge. Right. Um, you know, when I, uh, when I first took the grand out, um, John had, uh, reimbursed me for some tech work with a, a spare <laughs> Denison smock because he had a spare Denison smock. Um, and I just, I think I played four or five games at the end of last season wearing a Denison smock cargo, like khaki pants and a uh, ball cap just to annoy as many of the historical people, including Johnny, as I could. Yeah, sure, um, sure, sure. But, like, it was also hella comfy. Like, it, yeah. you know, it's just like, you know, like, Pat, why are you playing in, like, you know, your lazy, like, pajama airsoft gear? And I'm like, I'm comfy. It works yep. fine, you know? It And, you know, the Denison is good camo. The, the cargo is probably not so much, but, like, they're all OD, so they sort of blend in. Um, and, you know, it, it was a startlingly workable kit, um... And yeah, that was better than I expected it to be, right? Like that was an enjoyable change of pace as well, you know? Um, so if you're at the point where you're like, oh, I don't know if I want to bother putting all of my tack gear, man, put on a sweater or like a hoodie and some jeans and go play or soft in that. Um, yeah, and change, change your approach. And that's one of the great ways to, to break through that slump. Yeah, right? it's, it's, it's too easy to live in your own head about the hobby. Um, and like, sometimes you really do need to just be like, the hell with it. I'm just going to go goof around at whatever you're doing. Right. You know, like I've, I've been a tournament grinder in Warhammer. I have gotten sick of it and been like, man, I'm today. I'm just going to play nothing but stupid, terrible units. Let's rock Mm -hmm. it. You know? So you can change your approach. The second thing I think is a good way of approaching it, like we said, is to try and change what's going on in the field, right? Try and change the game modes, change the orientation, work with the refs to come up with different ways, or even just host your own game. Uh, if nothing else, it will give you an appreciation for how hard it is to actually host a decent airsoft game uh, and make you appreciate them even more when you're a participant. And I promise that but, stuff takes more organization than you initially think. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it's also a really good way to reinvigorate yourself Um, by looking at the game in a different lens. And Pat touched on this a little bit, but there are ways for you to integrate your other hobbies into Airsoft, right? So Pat and Johnny are interested in living history, so you bring that into Airsoft. You know, if you're someone like me who's interested in photography and videography, you can take photos of your team, you can start an Airsoft YouTube channel or a podcast, um, and it doesn't have to be tremendously successful. I mean, if you look at Uh, our success on YouTube, it is pretty mild in comparison to a lot of the big airsoft channels out there. Our podcast doesn't have a million listeners and that's okay because it's fun because going out to the game gives us material that we can use to make videos. It gives us material to get talk about when we're recording these podcasts. And 
when I'm playing the game, I'm having fun because I'm also then able to take that and sort of internalize it a little bit and think about what was interesting about that, what was fun, what was educational, and how can I convey that to other people? That's something I'm interested in, and that's one of the ways that I can keep Airsoft interesting for myself. And we end up having sort of fun and meta fun simultaneously, right? We're we're having fun playing Airsoft, and we're also having fun like talking in between games and thinking during games about how you know, we're going to convey this anecdote about this dumb thing Pat did to you guys. <laughs> yeah, or even stuff that's not that dumb. Uh, stuff that, you know, is about what is, you know, good upgrades for a gun and how do they work and, you know, what is over-voluming and under-voluming a barrel and all these interesting concepts that are, you know, ancillary to airsoft and are not equivalent to going out on the field. But if you're feeling sort of like, I don't know if I want to, you know, hit the field or whatever, if you just upgraded your gun and want to try something new that's some incentive to go out as well, right? So you can change not just your your approach in terms of what you're doing on the field, not just about the games, but also in the way that you approach the game in terms of all the other stuff that's around Airsoft, right? Modifying your interests in related in relation to the sport. Maybe it's collecting camo. Maybe it's, you know, learning how to tech gear and how it works on the field. All those things can be ways that you sort of keep it fresh in your mind. I think the last point is, you know what? You need to really critically evaluate, just like we always say, you need to critically evaluate everything. I think uh, overall, as a, as a human, you need to spend more time thinking about why you do the things that you do in general. I think that applies to most people, unless you're like, you know, uh, David Goggins or Jocko Willink or whatever. But most people need to spend more time critically evaluating why they do stuff the way that they do and be honest with yourself. And the reality is, if you are not wanting to go to the field because you're not going to have a good time and you go to the field and you don't have a good time, there is absolutely no issue, no problem at all with you taking a break and saying, you know what, I'm just going to shelf this for a while. But like Pat said, don't like sell all your gear immediately. We've seen that players do that where they go and they play every single week twice a week sometimes for months and months and months and then they're like i've done this 50 times it's always been the same thing i'm done i'm i'm selling all myself and they sell all of their stuff and then like a year and a half later they're back buying an aeg to get back into the sport yep and i mean it's sometimes it's worked out okay like we've we've had a couple of instances of that sort of thing happening and we you know we're like all right well i'll buy your gear and then a year later they're like can i have my gear back and it's like yeah <laughs> we're friends yeah you know but it uh it isn't always that happy an ending right and I think there's a lot to be said for being aware that, you know, like I said, hobbies are kind of cyclical. You know, you may reach a point where you're like, yeah, I don't, I don't really want to play Airsoft for the next month. You know, you might even be like, I don't want to play Airsoft for the next season. Sure. That's definitely happened to me. There's definitely been periods where I was just like, man, no, like I'm, I'm pretty done with this for now. Um, but ultimately I'm really glad that I still have all of my gear right? and, you know, that I didn't go, man, I'm just going to, did never give in to that. Eh, I'm just going to sell my gun, whatever I'm done. Um, yeah. Because I think it would have been harder for me to, uh, to get myself to come back. Right. Um, independent of the fact that like, it probably would have been hard for me to find money later to buy a new gun and upgrade it to the way I like my gun to be. Just, it would have been a hurdle for coming back. And every time I've taken a break, I've come back. And every time I've come back, I've been super happy to do so, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, and like one thing we haven't addressed, I guess, as much as, you know, but um, there's definitely a period relatively recently where I was, you know, and I was not playing a whole lot and Phil was like, well, make a point of coming out to like the team training days and practicing. And that kept me in, right? Um, in situations where I might've gotten rid of my stuff, honestly, like, you know, not in the sense that I, you know, it kept me going and playing, but like at least I was getting out and hanging out with my friends and maintaining my interest and maintaining a fun thing uh, where like I got some practice and so my skills weren't complete garbage the next time I went out and I got to hang out with my friends and be involved. Yeah, absolutely. If you're in a position where you've done some of the things maybe that we are talking about and you're still feeling burnt out, you know, one of the best things that you can do is, you know, reduce the frequency that you play and make sure that when you do play, you're setting yourself up to have the best possible experience. So if you have teammates, make sure that you're going out with your teammates. Yeah, If there's like four games a month, but only one of them is a big game, go to that game because you know it's going to be the highest percentage chance of you having the most fun possible because it's a, it's a big game. You know, by making the occasion a bit more interesting, you can make sure that you hopefully get the most out of it. But 
at the end of the day, and we're not going to tell, you know, we're not here to discourage people from playing airsoft, but the reality is that maybe you reach a point where this is no longer a hobby that you find interesting. And if that's the case, then you do need to be honest enough with yourself to say, okay, you know what, I've tried. It's really, it's really not it for me. And it's okay. But definitely don't, you know, like Pat said, uh, knee-jerk reaction, sell all your stuff before you're really, really confident that this is not something you're going to want to come back to. Be sure you don't like it before you sell your gear. But if you are sure you don't like it, um, you know, as much as we uh, we aren't here to tell you to quit airsoft at all, yeah, if you're consistently like, man, this is terrible, and you take a year off and you go back and you, like, again, this, this is still terrible, I don't want to do it anymore, don't do it anymore, right? Mm -hmm. um, you shouldn't, you don't owe it to the airsoft community to keep playing. You don't owe it to anyone to keep playing. It's a hobby. If it's fun, do it. If you reach a point where you're like, man, this is just not an enjoyable thing. I don't love this anymore. Life's too short. Find other stuff to do, right? There's, yeah. There are a thousand, thousand things that you could do. But I think, Pat, you hit the nail on the head. You know, life is too short to be doing stuff that you don't find fun or that you find frustrating. It's one thing if you find it frustrating, but you find you're getting something out of it. You know, like uh, learning a musical instrument is frustrating, but it's fun. If that's your situation, that that's not what yeah. we're talking about. Somet but. Sometimes going for a run really sucks. But like, yeah, exactly. You know, you want to eat pizza, so you need to go for a run uh, if you're food Absolutely. motivated, like I am. Uh, <laughs> yeah, me too. But if it's not good for you, if it's not benefiting you in some way, and you're finding it consistently unpleasant and unfun, find something better to do. You know? Yeah, your leisure time should be leisure. If it's stressful, if it's no fun, you know, you need to have a conversation with yourself about how can you make it more fun for yourself. And if the answer is I can't, then you have your answer, right? That being said, we've laid out a lot of different tools and ideas that you can try to keep the game fun and interesting for yourself. These are things that we have done ourselves, and sometimes we've done them more than more often than others. Uh, certain seasons require more effort than, than others, and like Pat said, sometimes you take a season off and that's okay. But at the end of the day, we found it to be very, very effective at keeping us interested and motivated in playing the game, getting better, going out for a laugh, having fun with our friends, progressing in a way that is meaningful to us and getting from airsoft what everyone ultimately wants to get which is just having really good fun positive experiences moments that we could look back fondly on and, and friendships that we can be really happy about uh, and carry on through the rest of our lives there's there's tons of fun to be had there's tons of stuff to appreciate um so i think probably the note we should end on is you know as much as is possible wherever you are in this weird year go play airsoft go have fun enjoy yourselves. It, it's mm -hmm. play. It should be fun. Absolutely. I couldn't have said it better. Guys, thank you so much for listening. Thanks for tuning in this week, and we'll talk to you next time. Thanks, everybody. Have a good week.